Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Rez Mani, and I'm an application scientist with Allied Scientific Pro. Uh, and today uh, we have this webinar called Photometry Webinar Level One. Uh, I've given this talk a few months ago, and uh, this is the second time I'm giving this talk. I modified it a little bit, and uh, hopefully it will be useful to you guys. Uh, after this. Uh, webinar uh, there will be a, an optional quiz that will be mailed mailed to you there will be 20 multiple choice questions and uh, you can uh, you can you can go through these and based on the information I've given here uh, you can you can answer those and uh, then the website will give you the correct answers my email is mentioned here armani at alliedscientificpro.com uh, if you're not sure about some of the answers, why the correct answer was given as, as one that was chosen, you can email me and I will, uh, I will explain it to you further. All right, so let's see what we'll be talking about uh, today. This is the outline of talk. So although uh, the talk uh, is titled Photometry, we will not only be talking about photometry, we'll also be talking about the wave nature of light, the particle nature of light, the electromagnetic radiation, different regions, uh, black body radiation, a uh, little bit of geometrical optics, uh, and then uh, uh, some colorimetry parameters such as PPFD, color temperature, CRI index, uh, S2P ratio, and then uh, some uh, radiometric and photometric units and the difference between these two units. Uh, those of you who have purchased the lighting passport uh, should uh, have seen these uh, parameters, PPFD, color temperature, S2P ratio, and some of you may wonder what these are. Uh, so uh, I will try my best to explain uh, what are these parameters mean exactly. All right, so let us start with the electromagnetic wave. So the electromagnetic energy has a wave aspect and a particle aspect. So we will first examine the, the wave aspect. Uh, so as a wave, it, it has an electric vector and it has a magnetic vector as shown by this red and blue arrows. And the direction of propagation of the wave is perpendicular to both of these vectors. Uh, so the electromagnetic uh, radiation comes in different wavelengths. Uh, its wavelength range uh, 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 ranges. Its wavelength ranges from 0 0.01 nanometer, uh, which is very small for gamma radiation, to about 100 kilometer for radio waves. And I'll show you a diagram that explains this this range uh, a, a little bit better. Uh, so wavelength is the distance between two peaks or two troughs. Uh, the visible light, uh, which we can see with our eyes, is only a small section of this wavelength of, of this range, electromagnetic spectrum. It's only from 400 to 700 nanometers. And I have to mention that uh, there are different definitions for the range of wavelengths. Uh, some people uh, have seen definitions where they define visible wavelengths from 380 to 750 nanometers. Uh, so uh, there are different definitions, but the definitions that we will stick to will be 400 to 700 nanometer. And the reason behind it is that there may be some eyes who are sensitive to uh, wavelengths higher than 700 nanometer and below 400, but most average eyes are only sensitive between 400 to 700. So we'll stick to this definition. Uh, now the wavelength, the frequency of an electromagnetic wave are related by the relation lambda, which is the wavelength equal to C, velocity of light divided by nu, where nu is the frequency in Hertz. C speed of light, three times into 10 to the eight meters per second or 300,000 kilometers per second. So you can see that when the frequency increases, for example, in case of gamma rays or ultraviolet, 
as compared to visible, uh, then the wavelength decreases. And when the frequency in decreases, such as in case of uh, infrared and radio waves, as compared to visible, then the wavelength would increase. So now let's look at the electromagnetic spectrum. And in this diagram, uh, actually 700 to 750 was, was shown as part of the visible, but I put a box around it to say that this is part of the far, far red. And far red ranges from 700 to 800 nanometers. So you can see all these colors, the rainbow colors, blue, green, yellow, orange, red. Uh, and this is only a tiny section in the electromagnetic spectrum. So if we look at the scales of this uh, diagram, the top scale shows the wavelength and the smallest value is about uh, 10 to the minus 11 meters or 0 0.01 nanometers, which is in the gamma ray uh, region. And these gamma rays are emitted uh, during the radioactive uh, uh, basically activity and uh, nuclear reactions, a very high energetic uh, radiation that is emitted. Uh, then we go uh, to x-rays, a little bit longer wavelength. The bottom, bottom one is frequency, so the frequency is decreasing, the wavelength is increasing. So x-rays have longer wavelength compared to gamma rays, and x-rays, uh, uh, everyone knows uh, about them, especially when when fractures a bone, these will take uh, good pictures and show where the damage is. Then we would move on to the ultraviolet, uh, which ranges somewhere from 100 nanometers to 400 nanometers, and that has different sections, uh, vacuum ultraviolet, UVC, UVB, and UVA. I'll explain that later. And then this tiny section, which is the visible, then you would have the infrared, which is, uh, well, 700 to 800 is the uh, far red, and then all the way to 100 microns, uh, you have uh, infrared radiation. The near infrared usually is only up to two microns, but uh, then when you get to the four or five micron, it's all mid infrared, and then uh, far infrared up to 100 microns. Then you would go to uh, this region, which are centimeter, uh, centimeter long wavelength microwaves. Uh, and the, the, the most famous uh, of all is the microwave oven frequency, which is at 2.45 gigahertz. And its wavelength is about 12 centimeters, which lies right around here, this dashed line. And uh, finally, the radio waves, which have the longest wavelengths uh, up to 100 kilometers, uh, so that is where we send our radio signals. So this is uh, some kind of picture of what the range of electromagnetic spectrum is, and again it shows that increasing wavelength corresponds to uh, decreasing, uh, increasing wavelength corresponds to decreasing frequency and uh, decreasing wavelength corresponds to increasing frequency. And we'll show that increasing frequency also means increasing energy. And that comes from the particle uh, picture, not the wave nature, but the particle nature of light. So the particle nature of light, uh, the wave aspects of light was known back in the 18th century. There were a number of different uh, a phenomena that was explored, diffraction, refraction, interference, polarization. These are all the things that were known uh, to scientists of the uh, 18th century, and uh, they knew that uh, the light uh, has the wave properties, behaves like a wave. But then in the beginning of 20th centuries, a number of experiments were performed uh, including uh, photoelectric effect, uh, where they knocked uh, uh, basically electrons from a metal plate by shining light, and also Compton effect, which was like a billiard ball uh, collisions between photons and electrons. 
And uh, all these experiments pointed to the fact that light is behaving like a particle and not like a wave. So as a particle, a quantized bundle of energy is called photon and its energy is inversely proportional to wavelength. So this uh, relation E equal to H nu was uh, first devised by Max Planck. It's a famous formula uh, where H is the Planck's constant uh, and its value is 6.63 into 10 to the minus 34 joules second. And nu is the frequency of light and E is the energy of the photon. You can also use the previous relation nu equal to C over lambda to put it in this manner, HC over lambda. And that shows that as the wavelength of, of light increases, the energy decreases. And as the wavelength decreases, the energy increases because these two are constants. So that's why, for example, we can conclude that an ultraviolet uh, photon, which has a shorter wavelength as compared to an infrared photon, has higher energy. And uh, for example, gamma rays, they're highly energetic photons because their wavelength is the shortest. Uh, so this was the uh, basis of the particle nature of light. Now, in this diagram, um, uh, I would like to ask you to focus only on this right section and ignore the, the other, other parts. Uh, this is showing that the far red radiation is from 700 to 800 nanometers. Uh, there is uh, a link here which I pasted uh, that talks more about the far red radiation. If someone is uh, more interested to to learn more about it, and uh, uh, I want like I would like to explain a little bit more what is the usage of this far red radiation, except especially when it comes to horticulture. For those of you who, who, who purchased the lighting passport or, uh, you know, or otherwise you're interested in horticulture, what is the, the use of this 700 to 800 nanometer far red radiation for plants? Uh, so uh, the far red radiation is transmitted by leaves, but the red radiation, which is below 700 nanometer, is heavily absorbed. So here in this diagram, you can just see that there is a plant that is exposed to sunlight and uh, it's receiving both uh, red and far red radiation. And the ratio of these plays an important role, red to far red, this ratio is given by 1.2. Uh, now on the right side, the diagram B, you see another plant is been, has been covered by another plant. So because the far red radiation is transmitted through the leaves, there is no change in the level of far red, but the red is being blocked by the, by the leaf. It's being absorbed by this other plant. So as a result, the red to far red ratio decreases to 0.2. So it was 1.2 over here. And when this plant has been shadowed by another plant, it has decreased to 0.2. So this phenomenon is called, uh, uh, it is related to something called the shade avoidance response because the plant uses this ratio, red to far red, to, to, to understand that it's uh, being shadowed by another plant and therefore try to grow in another direction so that it could be coming out of that shadow. Uh, and this phenomenon is called the shade avoidant response. So notice that, for example, if there's a cloud that is covering the, the, the sun, um, uh, in this case, uh, both the red and far red will go down equally, uh, and therefore the ratio would remain the same. But in case of the shadowing, uh, only the far red, only the red will go down, the far red is transmitted through the leaf and remains the same. So the ratio decreases. So this is important for uh, plants to know that they're being shadowed and they find that as a way of coming out of the shadow. All right, let's talk a little bit about the UV radiation. Uh, so the UV radiation is right before the visible light as far as the wavelength is concerned. Again, there are different definitions for UV, but the definition that we're going with 
is uh, uh, we define the UVA radiation from 320 to 400 nanometer. So 400 is the edge of the visible radiation. And then the UVB 290 to 320, UVC from 200 to 290. And then vacuum ultraviolet or VUV less than 200 nanometers. And this is from, say, 100 to 200 nanometers is vacuum ultraviolet. Why do they call it vacuum ultraviolet? Because nitrogen and oxygen in the air molecules will absorb uh, wavelengths, radiation of wavelengths below 200 nanometer. So in order to observe this radiation, you have to make to put the lamp in a vacuum. And then only, only then you can let this propagate. So the UVA, UVB, UVC uh, need more, more explanation, and that will be in the next slide. Uh, this is a diagram uh, that is showing the, basically the sun spectrum, and TOA stands for top of the atmosphere, and that's shown by the brown line. And this one is the, uh, on the ground, the, the bluish one is underground. And uh, although this is taken from another book uh, and the definitions of UVA, UVB, UVC is a little bit different, but the point that this diagram wants to make, and by the way, this was taken at somewhere in Africa, 10 degree north and five degree west, somewhere, somewhere in uh, West Africa. Uh, so what we can observe from this diagram is that uh, luckily, we uh, are lucky here on Earth that the ozone layer absorbs uh, UVC radiation. So the UVC on the ground is zero, although if you go to the top of the atmosphere, it's not zero uh, because the ozone layer, which lies about 20 to 30 kilometers above the atmosphere, absorbs all UVC and also more than 90% of UVB. So you can see UVB is much smaller here as compared to here. And uh, for UVA, something like 80% of UVA will make it to the ground level. So that is the reason why, uh, for example, people who go to the beach use a, a, a sunscreen lotion to protect themselves from UVA and UVB, because uh, this lotion would absorb whatever UVA and UVB uh, reaches the ground. And uh, being exposed to these radiation, especially UVB, has some, uh, could create issues such as uh, skin cancer and cataract and uh, UV is, is quite damaging. So uh, let's look at the emission spectra of the sun and the earth. Uh, this is the sun and you can see it's a smooth curve and it peaks around 555 nanometers in the green region. And this is the Earth. Uh, it peaks around uh, 10 micron. Uh, so this kind of smooth radiation uh, is actually called the black body radiation. It's a very famous term in, in, in optics, black body radiation uh, and radiometry. Body Black body is a perfect absorber of emission. No incident radiation is reflected by a black body. It's also a perfect emitter of radiation. So whatever radiation is, is impinged, is, is shining on it, it absorbs, and it also perfectly emits all the radiation back. So both the sun and the earth are approximated to be black bodies. And the sun uh, is a 5,800 Kelvin black body. So uh, this formula for the black body radiation was first uh, devised by Max Planck and uh, it's a function of temperature. So if you put a 5800 uh, uh, Kelvin temperature in Planck's formula, you would arrive at the, at the, the shape of this curve. And uh, for Earth, it's also a black body, but it has a lower temperature of 300 Kelvin. So what happens is that solar radiation falls on the, on the ground. Uh, the visible radiation is absorbed by the ground, by the Earth's surface, and then it re-emits it back in 
uh, infrared radiation at 10 micron, around peak at 10 micron. And, and Earth has a 10 micron, uh, basically, peak. It's a 300 Kelvin black body. The sun is a 5,800 Kelvin black body. So we just uh, examined these two laws uh, about black bodies. So you can see this is a 6,000 K black body, roughly about the Earth, roughly the temperature of the, the sun, sorry, the temperature of the sun black body. And this is a 300 K black body, which is of uh, the same temperature as the Earth. And this is a 1 K. And what we notice here is that as the temperature of the black body uh, increases, uh, the peak of the radiation uh, moves towards the shorter wavelength. So here you can, it's given this relation by Wien's displacement law. So uh, if you put a, and this is the relation, so if you put a 6,000 Kelvin here, uh, then you get a, a wavelength of about 0.5 micron, which is 500 nanometers, 550, the green, uh, which is the peak of the solar radiation. And if you put a 300K here, you get something like 10 micron, which is the peak of the Earth radiation in, in uh, thermal infrared. So this relation defines that. And then there's also another relation, a Stefan Boltzmann law, which defines the uh, irradiance, which is the, the amount of energy per, uh, per unit area or, or in the units of watts per meter square and relates that to the emissivity of the body, uh, which is epsilon. And for a black body, this emissivity is one. So it ranges from zero to one. And then sigma is the uh, constant Boltzmann, Stefan Boltzmann constant given by this, this value here and to the fourth power of the temperature. So this relation is telling us that the uh, amount of irradiance would increase as the fourth power of temperature. So it is also the amount of irradiance is equal to the area under the curve. So as the temperature increases, the area under the curve increases as the fourth power of the temperature. Uh, so these are two very useful relations, the Stefan Boltzmann law and Wien's displacement law. And I should go back actually to the previous slide and mention one more thing about black body is that uh, uh, black body, as you also change its temperature, uh, it will show different colors. And that will be related to color temperature, which I'll explain later. Okay, so uh, let's talk a little bit about geometrical optics because there will be a question in the quiz about geometrical optics. And uh, this is about the refractive index and Snell's law. So uh, Snell's law of refraction basically to, uh, tells us that when a beam of light is incident at a boundary between uh, a lower refractive index and a higher refractive index uh, medium, such as air and water, then it will bend. It will bend towards the normal. And one can see that if you put a stick into the pond, you see it's as if it's broken. So, but it's not really broken. It's because of refraction that you see it broken. Uh, so air has a refractive index of one. And the definition of refractive index is the ratio of the speed of light uh, in the in vacuum to the speed of light in that medium. So uh, the speed of light is fastest in vacuum. It's 3 into 10 to the 8 meters per second. And when light enters uh, a denser body, such as water or glass, the speed of light decreases. And the ratio of the speed of light in vacuum to the speed of light in that medium is the refractive index. So uh, we can see that uh, this relation, uh, these are the refractive indices of the two materials. So in this case, N1 would be of air, which is one, and N2 would be water, which is 1.3, is equal to the ratio of the sine of the angles. 
sine theta 1 over sine theta 2. So since n2 is larger than n1, then sine theta 1 would be greater than sine theta 2, and theta 1 would be greater than theta 2. So that means that the ray of light would bend. Another very interesting application of this is that if you are coming from the, the denser to the, uh, to the rarer medium or less denser medium, after a certain angle of incidence, the beam would not enter the, the rare medium anymore, but it just bounces back. back. Uh, so this application is used in optical fibers where the center or the, uh, the core of the fiber has a higher refractive index than the cladding or the, 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 the surrounding of the core has a slightly ref smaller refractive index. So the beam of light basically just goes uh, and gets total internally reflected inside the fiber and propagates. So this was about the refractive index. Uh, let me just uh, check to see if there has been any any questions so far. I'll, I'll stop at the end and you can ask your questions at the end if you like. Uh, I've marked uh, each slide with a with a with a number here so you could let me know where is your question I'll go back to that slide so next uh, uh, again this has to do with the particle properties of light and this parameter that we measure using lighting passport also called the PPFD the photosynthetic photon flux density so this is another way of con joules per second uh, per meter square uh, into number of photons. So as I said uh, before, this is the Planck's formula, E equal to nH nu. So if you have only one photon, it will be E equal to H nu. But if you have a billion photons, that will be, this N will be a billion. So you can convert the joules in the watts into number of photons. Uh, basically use this relation, know the frequency of light, and if you know the energy in joules, you can find the number of photons. And therefore, you could convert watts, which is joules per second, into number of photons per second per meter square. So the photosynthetic photon flux density is measured in foot is in photons is measuring photons per meter square per second instead of joules per meter square per second. So it converts the total energy into number of photons. Now there's another unit here, it's called micromoles, micromoles per meter square per second. And if you've ever used the lighting passport, you see it will give you the uh, PPFD in micromoles. Uh, it doesn't give you a, a value, a number of photons, it gives you in micromoles. And this is a unit which is 6.023 to 10 to the 23. It's been borrowed from a, a chemistry, and it's actually the Avogadro number, which is number of molecules in the molecular weight of a substance, or number of atoms in the atomic weight of a substance. So for example, if you consider sodium, its atomic weight is 23 grams. So according to chemistry, uh, in uh, 23 grams of sodium, there will be 6.023 into 10 to the 23 atoms of sodium, which is the Avogadro number. Uh, so the micro refers to 10 to the minus six. So this unit, uh, micromole, uh, is just borrowing the number. It has nothing to do with atomic weight or, or number of atoms. Uh, it's just borrowing the number from this uh, chemistry concept. So one micromole, for example, would be 6.023 into 10 to the 17, because it's 10 to the minus 6 of 10 to the 23. So why this is done and why is it converted to number of photons is because for photosynthesis process, the energy of the individual photon is more important than the total energy. So photosynthesis is a particle is more sensitive to the number of particles 
uh, that are that are shining on the plant um, as opposed to the total energy so it's useful to convert that into number of photons one has to consider that red photons have less energy than blue photons because their wavelength is longer their frequency is higher so for a fixed optical power the PPFD of red photon is larger than blue. Uh, and why is that? Because, for example, for one joule of energy, there should be more number of photons in red as compared to blue to make up for that amount of energy. So that's something one has to consider. Next, we'll explain color temperature. And I'm, uh, those of you who have used gliding passport have seen uh, this parameter, color temperature. And some of you may be wondering, what's the difference between the color temperature and the temperature? So uh, color temperature, when a, when a black body, you heat a black body, you see that its color changes. So uh, uh, you can see that uh, it goes through different... Uh, different colors uh, and for any color corresponding to that temperature is conventionally expressed in absolute temperature of kelvins uh, using the symbol K. So for example uh, at about temperatures about 2700 to 3000 K a black body that is being heated it looks red yellowish white through red and then now uh, it, it goes uh, uh, at higher temperatures, around 5,000 becomes bluish white. Uh, so all these uh, temperatures uh, are related to a color. So each color is related, the color of the black body is related to a particular temperature. So uh, therefore, when we talk about color temperature, it, we are associating the color that we are observing with the color of a black body that has been heated to that temperature. But one has to uh, uh, notice that, let's say if you're looking at a red color LED, uh, the LED is not at 3000 Kelvin. It's just that the red color we are observing is associated with the red color of a black body that has been heated to 3000 Kelvin. So, uh, there's a difference between color temperature and color and the actual temperature. They could be the same if you're actually heating the body, but not necessarily. For example, red LED is not heated to 3000 Kelvin, but it's color temperature. Its temperature may be uh, 30, 30 C, but it's, uh, or 300 Kelvin, but uh, around 300 Kelvin, but its color temperature is 3000 Kelvin. The other parameter that you see is correlated color temperature, or CCT. Now, uh, what is the CCT? Uh, you can measure this with the lighting passport, and this is uh, the color appearance of a light emitted by a lamp, and uh, it may not be exactly a black body, but you could associate the, 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 the color temperature of that to a black body. So normally, uh, in the curves that I'll show in the next slide, if a, a light source is a black body, uh, its uh, uh, basically coordinates should fall on a black body curve. But if it is not a black body, it will, it will fall outside of that. But then you can actually correlate uh, the temperature, uh, the color temperature to a black body. I'll explain this further in the next slide, it becomes more clear. So here, uh, this thing we have, uh, and this is something that Lighting Passport also produces, it's called the chromaticity diagram. So chromaticity diagram maps uh, human color perception in terms of two coordinates, X and Y. So here you have these values, X and Y, from say, these are less than one, uh, and uh, all the monochromatic light, which has only one color, they fall, they fall on, the, on the surroundings of this curve. So here you can just see here you have only green and the, and the wavelengths are also shown here. Green and over here you have only pure red and here you have pure blue. But when you mix the temperatures, the colors, and you get different colors, 
And this curve that you see over here is the black body curve. So once you make a measurement with the uh, lighting passport, for example, you see there is a there's a there's a dot that appears somewhere. So this dot could fall could either fall on this curve, the black body curve. In that case, uh, you would have the actual color temperature because it was a black body. Or alternatively, it could fall outside of that curve. Like in this case, you can see. A and B, they fell outside of this, this black body curve. Now, there are these isothermal lines that are perpendicular to the black body curve, and uh, they have been labeled with different temperatures. So in this case, uh, this, these two sources that have been measured uh, uh, fall on the 3,000 Kelvin isothermal line. So that's why they call the the correlated color temperature of these two sources is 3000 K. So that's the difference between color temperature and correlated color temperature. Next, we will talk about the CRI index. Uh, again, this is a parameter that is measured by lighting passport. Uh, what is CRI index? So you can see these apples here that have different colors. So the way to define CRI index is the effect of an illuminant on the color appearance of objects by conscious or subconscious comparison with their color appearance uh, comparison with their appearance under a reference illuminant. So this may be a little bit difficult to grasp. The simpler way of saying is that uh, you would uh, shine uh, any light of your whatever source that you want to use and then compare the color appearance of an object with a color appearance of the same object under a reference lamp. So if you have an apple which is red color and you, you look at it under the sunshine it looks really red and the red comes out very clearly and very naturally. But if you put the same apple under different light sources, like could be a fluorescent light or could be a uh, other metal halide light or LED, uh, different colored LEDs, it may the color may not show so naturally. So a CRI index is uh, is a way to measure how naturally the color of the object comes out. Um, in, under that particular lamp. So you're comparing the color appearance uh, under that lamp with the color appearance under a black body source, which will have give it its, its fullest natural uh, perception. So in this case, you can see this one on the left has a CRI index of 97. So it's most likely illuminated by a black body source. And here you have 90, gets fainter, fainter, and fainter 70. So here the red doesn't show that well. So the lower CRI index uh, represents poorer quality of illumination. The color doesn't show that well, doesn't reproduce well. Now, one has to uh, notice that the CRI index is meaningless for monochromatic light. Uh, it only has value for lights that are continuous. So if you have a red LED, for example, or a blue LED, you can't define a CRI index. You have you can define it for a white LED, which is a mixture of colors. Uh, so, or for a fluorescent lamp, uh, which has also a mixture of colors. But for a single uh, more chromatic light, it's meaningless. Here's a table uh, that shows uh, the CRI index for different lamps. And I've uh, pointed with this arrow. Uh, so you can see tungsten lamp uh, 100 is perfect CRI. It's a black body. Uh, and then tungsten halogen 95, linear fluorescent 50 to 99, compact fluorescent 82. And here we have low pressure sodium, which has a monochromatic light at around 589 nanometers. Uh, so if you put uh, a red apple under this you know doesn't doesn't look red at all, and in fact the CRI does not is meaningless in this case because this is not a 
continuous wavelength source. It's a monochromatic or single wavelength source. Now we have high pressure sodium uh, 25, very low metal halide 60, white LED 70. So objects color appear more naturally under illumination of a higher CRI index. And for monochromatic light, the CRI index is meaningless. Okay. Next parameter is S to P ratio. Again, this is uh, something that lighting passport measures. Uh, so what is this S to P ratio? Is the ratio of escotopic uh, or dark to photopic light human eye sensitivity functions. So let's explain this a little bit further. So if you look at the structure of the human eye, uh, you see that there is the cornea and then the retina consists of cones and rods. I'm sure you've heard about the cones and rods. So cones are about 6 million of them are mostly in the central area of the retina and they have sensitivity to uh, the colors as well. And then you have the rods which spread farther apart and uh, there are about 120 million of them and they could only see in black and white. So under under um, illuminations that are higher, uh, which we call the photopic, where there's lots of sunshine, the eye sensitivity varies. It has a different response as compared to lower uh, uh, illumination conditions. Uh, so you can just see this is a eye sensitivity curve at uh, a high illumination uh, and it peaks at around 555 nanometers which is green, and that's the peak, peak sensitivity of black body radiation of the sun. Uh, so our eyes have evolved over millions of years to correspond to the, uh, the peak sensitivity of the sun. The peak sensitivity of our eyes is equal to the peak sensitivity of the sun under uh, high illumination conditions. But in the darker conditions, uh, the rods play more important role and uh, and their peak sensitivity is at about 507 nanometers. So if you integrate the area under the curves and find the ratio, that will give you the S to P ratio. Uh, so uh, the larger the S to P ratio means a better ability to see under both dark and light conditions, a large dynamic range, in other words. So it will the light source that has a higher S to P ratio will stimulate the eye more. And then one could ask the question, now how do you measure these? Uh, well, one can actually uh, compare uh, the eye sensitivity with a calibrated source and uh, change the wavelength with a, with a spectrometer and then uh, basically um, compare the, the, the illumination level. And this way you could generate these curves, the scotopic over photopic or S to P ratio. Now let's talk a little bit about radiometry and photometry. Uh, so radiometry is the science of measuring light in any portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. It does not confine itself to a particular section uh, in practice, the term is usually limited to measurement of infrared, visible, and ultraviolet light using optical instruments. And irradiance is the intensity of light and is measured in watts per square meter. All right, so radiometry um, does not confine itself to any particular region and measures more in all regions of uh, the spectrum. Uh, however, photometry is the science of measuring visible light. And notice the word visible in units that are weighted according to the sensitivity of the human eye. So uh, human eye plays an important role in photometry and uh, it only uh, measures values uh, which are weighted according to the sensitivity of human eye in the visible region, 400 to 700 nanometer. So if you are outside of that region, you're in ultraviolet, photometric units do not mean anything. The photometric equivalent of irradiance is called illuminance 
and is measured in lumens per square meter or lux. Uh, so this lux is something you've probably seen in the lighting passport with those of you who have uh, used it. Uh, so I'll have to explain the, these units of lumen uh, uh, and there's also other units, photometric units. So a lux, however, is the equivalent of uh, watts per square meter. But lux is in the photometric unit and watts per square meter is the radiometric unit. But before we explain these uh, uh, units, uh, well, let's understand the difference between photometers and spectrometers. Uh, photometer uh, measures the total light output. Uh, for example, it could be in lumen value. Uh, and this could company Lycor has a very famous photometer and it doesn't distinguish between different wavelengths. However, a spectrometer such as our lighting passport uh, not only measures the, the, the light output, but also measures it at each different wavelength. So there's a diffraction grating that separates the different wavelengths of light and shines it on the detector. So you will also have uh, a, an understanding of what, what is the light output at each different wavelength. So that's the spectrometer and that's the photometer. Let's go back to the radiometric and photometric units. This chart uh, explains this. Uh, so, so for every radiometric unit, uh, which is shown on the left side uh, in red, there is a corresponding photometric unit in blue on the right side. So let's just start with the radiant power, which we call watts, uh, this units of watts. So radiant power in units of watts or joules per second. And the equivalent uh, uh, unit is lumens in case of uh, photometric, photometric units. Okay. And then uh, further down, uh, you can talk about power per unit solid angle. The solid angle is basically just the cone uh, that is uh, subtended uh, by, the, by the light source. And uh, you can say in radiometric units, the unit of that is watts per steradian. Uh, steradian is a unit of solid angle. But in case of photometric units, it's lumens per steradian, or we call it candela. And that's actually called the uh, light intensity. And why they call it uh, light intensity in photometric units, sorry. Candela, why they call it candela is because uh, typically the light intensity of a, of a candle is one candela. And that was the standard that was used before uh, at the beginning of uh, 20th century, maybe in the 19th century. Uh, so you can also talk in terms of uh, ir power per unit area or irradiance, which we talked about before, watts per meter square. And the corresponding unit for photometry is illuminance, which is lumens per meter square or lux. Okay, so lumen is the luminous power and this divide by meter square gives you lux. You can talk in terms of looking at the illuminated surface or looking at the source. So you could point the lighting passport at the source or you could point it at the illuminated surface like a plant leaf, for example. This corresponds to plant leaf this corresponds to the, this corresponds to plant leaf and this corresponds to the source itself. And then you also have the power per unit area per solid angle. Uh, so that in radiometry, it's given by the unit watts per meter square per steradian. But in photometry, it will be lumens per steradian per meter square or candela per meter square or NIT. That's another a definition there, NIT. Uh, in fact, in uh, uh, radiometry, this is called radiance, and in photometry, uh, you'll call it's called luminance. So, so uh, to summarize, photometry measures that part of the radiant power perceived by the human eye as light, 
and radiometry measures the entire radiant power and the quantities derived from it. This chart basically summarizes all the uh, relations between radiometric and photometric units. So let's uh, look at the definitions of candela and lumen one more time. Candela, SI unit of luminous intensity. One candela is a luminous intensity in a given direction of a source that emits monochromatic radiation of frequency 540 into 10 to the 12 hertz and has a radiant intensity in that direction of 1 over 683 watt per stir radian. So uh, this picture shows that uh, this comes from plumber's candle uh, as used by plumbers in 19th century to melt lead solder when joining water pipes. So the intensity of this in photometric unit is uh, one candela. And lumen is the SI unit of luminous flux equal to the amount of light emitted per second in a unit solid angle of one is radian from a uniform source of one candela. Okay, so if you have a source that has a one candela intensity such as this and you shine it over one is radian, remember the whole uh, surface is four pi is radian. So if you, if you shine it over one is radian, uh, which is a portion of that, then uh, uh, that will give the amount of the luminous power of one lumen. And the luminous efficacy is another parameter, is a measure of how well a light source produces visible light. It's a ratio of luminous flux to power measured in lumens per watt in SI. So the power here, by that we mean the electrical power, not the optical power. So uh, how much uh, light is produced in lumen per electrical uh, consumption of energy in watts. And lamps should specify that. So here, for example, uh, we, are we are going deeper into this. The wattage of these lamps refer to electrical power consumption. For example, when you talk about a 60 watt lamp, it consumes 60 watt of electrical power but uh, uh, the lamps normally also specify their optical output in lumens as well. For example, a 60 watt lamp could be marked as 900 lumens. So the 900 lumens is the optical power, the 60 watt is the electrical power. And now we could compare the compact fluorescent lamp, the incandescent lamp and LED and uh, look at their efficiency. Uh, we know that both LED and compact fluorescent lamp are more efficient than the incandescent lamp, which only converts 5% of the energy of the electrical energy into the light output. So it's basically a heat lamp. Typically a 60 watt CFL lamp produces 800 lumens light output. The LED will produce double of that light output for the same wattage. So something like 1600 lumens. An incandescent lamp will produce much less, up to 10 times less. So the choice is obvious in a way that these lamps, incandescent lamps should, should be discarded because they consume a lot of energy and they produce such less uh, output, uh, optical output. Here is a chart that compares the three types of lamps, LED, incandescent and CFL. And you can just see that here it says equivalent to 60 watt uh, bulb. So this, the standard here is the incandescent. So uh, for same amount of light output, uh, if the incandescent use 60 watt, uh, light emitting diode would only use six to eight watts of electrical power. And the compact fluorescent will only use 13 to 15 watts. So in terms of, uh, kilowatt hours, you can see that the light emitting diode consumes the less, 329 as opposed to 3,285 for incandescent and 767 for compact fluorescent. And the cost is, is lowest for LED as compared to, well, doesn't, it's about half of the comp compact fluorescent lamp and one tenth of the incandescent. The choice is uh, pretty obvious uh, which direction we have to go as far as the 
in illumination is concerned. So that is about uh, 55 minutes. Uh, and uh, I thank you for listening to this talk. And I will be glad to answer any questions. You can either type your question or if you could, you can unmute yourself and tell me your question. Okay, Susanna Buchanan to everyone. For the electromagnetic spectrum. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. It's easier that way. You were okay. quoting something for the electromagnetic spectrum and I was taking notes. I just want to make sure that I had it correct. Increasing okay. wavelength corresponds with decreasing energy or decreasing frequency? Or I guess both. All right, just a minute. Let me let me go there. I'll show it to you. So uh, decreasing decreasing energy means increasing wavelength okay okay so increasing energy means decreasing wavelength and increasing frequency okay All right. great yeah thank you you're welcome any other question uh, okay Shirak what PPFD range is ideal for plant growth okay so that is a very good question that Shirag is asking and uh, I have to explain that uh, let's go back to the PPFD uh, it actually depends on the plant so uh, each plant is different uh, so for example uh, uh, you can find this in some literature uh, online uh, what is good for each plant. There are some papers, there's some research that has been done on this. Uh, normally for leafy plants, uh, you have, you need a lot of red and uh, uh, some blue. You need less blue than red. Uh, so, and you don't need as much green, basically. But then there are some other uh, plants such as uh, medicinal plants, uh, that require a lot of blue, more than red, during their, uh, basically, their, their growth. Uh, when they're, yeah, so there, there are several stages. In one stage, in the earlier stages, they need more blue than red. And then when the actual flowering starts, then they, could, they need more red than blue. So that question has to be answered depending on the plant. You can't just give a general answer. Uh, you know, one can do a search depending on what kind of plant you want to use. Uh, there are uh, different types of recipes, light recipes. So uh, I'll refer you to those literature online. You're welcome. Next person. Cuando van a actualizar la app? When the Ascentex application is updated? This is a question, Rodrigo, uh, you have to ask from Ascentec, uh, uh, Ascentec. I, I, don't, I don't deal with that. Uh, you can just send them an email and ask them. Any other question? The quiz is quite uh, uh, general and covers basically all the talk, uh, all the topics that was given in the talk. So if you take the quiz, uh, you know, it will give you a good idea of, uh, uh, you know, the, the topics that we discussed. Next question. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see that. Yeah, you're right. Sorry. I apologize. I often can find power meter in market. Uh, should it not be named PPFD 
meter or what is different? Okay, so uh, usually uh, the PAR meter depends if it is a spectral or it's not a spectral. So you could measure the total PAR with the PAR meter, but it doesn't tell you what is the, the, the split for each wavelength. But uh, uh, you can have basically a PPFD spectrum where a PAR meter cannot give you a PPFD spectrum. It will just give you the total value of PPFD. But if you buy the lighting passport, it will give you the PPFD spectrum. So that's the difference. Okay, next question. Uh, why same temperature light in LED and fluorescent give us a different color? Tom time. Oh, uh, let me continue. Uh, I mean, complete the answer to Tom. Uh, in which range? Well, it should be uh, 380 to uh, 7, 380 to 780. 380 to 780 nanometer is a range that you could measure the PPFD. This is what the lighting passport could give you. Did I answer your question? Yeah, but ours is a little bit wider. It's a little bit wider because plants also use uh, uh, ultraviolet and a uh, little bit of ultraviolet and uh, infrared as well. So we give you a wider range. But you're right that most of the energy, the PPFD, should be looked at in the 400 to 700 nanometer. Did I answer your question completely, Tom? You're welcome. Okay, let me go on to the next question. Why same temp? This is asked by Jorge. Jorge, uh, why same temperature light in LED and fluorescent fluorescent give us uh, a different color on a fabric or white fabric? So I assume you mean, Jorge, you mean the same color temperature, right? Do you mean the color temperature? So if you mean the color temperature, uh, about three, what do you mean? Oh, about 6,500 K. Okay, yeah, I got it, yeah. Well, the... Uh, the color temperature uh, uh, does not define the light source completely because uh, you could have the same color temperature, but you, if you look at the spectral composition of that light, it may be different. Uh, it may not be the same. So normally uh, uh, the color temperatures, uh, let me actually draw something for you. Uh, I'll show you if you can just see my screen right now. So you can have uh, an LED. An LED spectrum would normally look like this. This is an LED spectrum. So LED. All right. But if you look at the compact fluorescent lamp spectrum, it has many lines. So it could be like this. So uh, when you shine a compact fluorescent light uh, on a, our lighting passport or LED, uh, it may give you the same color temperature as some kind of average value that it gives you, but uh, the spectral composition is different. So that's why it just looks slightly different. But you can still define Will you please show the slide about, okay, next question. Will you please show the slide about CT versus CT? Okay, you're welcome, Jorge. I missed part of it for my notes. Okay, CT versus CT. Yeah, sure. I will do that, Sarah. Uh, CT versus CCT. Yeah, there you go. 
5,000. Oh, there's one thing actually I missed to say about this. Uh, I apologize for that. It's thank you, Sarah, for letting me know about this because I missed uh, explaining one thing here, which I do now. Uh, so when uh, color temperature over 5,000 K are called cool colors. So uh, this is, has a count. The color temperature has a counterintuitive, uh, you can say, is a uh, meaning because when you go to higher color temperatures, they're actually called the cool colors. So bluish white at 5,000 K is cool colors, while lower color temperature, which is 3,000 K are called the warm colors. So, uh, so if you're talking about a warm color, you're actually talking about lower color temperature. So it's counter counterintuitive. 